Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brighton Area Schools Board of Education meeting. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Ms. Ackermite, roll call, please. Present. Here. Mr. Mark? Here. Mr. Cromley? Here. Mr. Myers? Here. All right, that moves us to the approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion? Moved. Moved by Mr. Trombley. Support. Supported by Mr. Connolly. Any discussion? Oh, uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, amend our agenda as well. I'd like to add item I, which is a change order from Clark number 457. Okay. We have a motion, Mr. Trombley. Any support? Support. Support by Mr. Connolly. Any discussion? This is the, the, the just getting this back in here. Yeah. So, yeah, that is change order number 457 uh, that is going to be coming forward. All right. All those in favor of approval of the agenda as amended, signify by aye. 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 Any nays? That passes 6 0. That moves us to the superintendent report, Dr. Outlaw. Over there. All right. Well, thank you so much. I have uh, three things this evening. I'm going to start off with our student representative, Josh Cortez. I have some exciting information about our uh, National Honor Society program that will be second. And then third, I'm going to share a little bit of information uh, from our uh, security commission, give you a little bit of update on some of the things that are uh, being worked on currently. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Josh Cortez. Hello. As the year concludes, we do have a lot of groups doing certain things at school. So to begin, for the leadership class, we're organizing a lip dub right now. And that will take place on May 16th, once all AP exams conclude. And we're also reaching out to all the groups at Brighton High School so we can get a diverse section of representation from each, uh, each of the groups that we have at Brighton High School. Then also, we're working on a Scranton Mentorship Committee, where we submitted a Google, Google form to the middle schoolers down at Scranton, and they submitted back to us with their questions. And then right now we're working on making videos and those will be shown in like their homeroom hours. So that'll be really good for them because they're, it's a big jump making the jump from Scranton to the high school. So hopefully that will help them. And for exec board, we're currently planning the student council banquet, which will take place this Thursday at Whispering Pines Country Club. Um, for student council, senior class council is working on graduation right now which will take place on June 9th at 8 p.m. on the BHS football field. 
Junior class council is currently planning prom and that's a really big undertaking. So that's taking all their focus right now. And they also wrapped up their staff student basketball where the students got their first win against the staff. So that was great. And then, like I said, prom is going to take place on June 3rd at Suburban Collection Showplace in Novi. And then right now, sophomore and freshman class councils are just helping out where additional help is needed. Um, some important senior dates this week. We have AP exams. The first week wrapped up last week, um, but there's more this week. And then May 10th is our senior meeting. Uh, May 16th is our lip dub, like I said. And then May 22nd through 26th is Senior Survivor Week, which I'm sure NHS is going to talk more about. Um, June 2nd is the last day of school and the senior walk. June 3rd is prom. The June 7th is a summa cum laude breakfast. June 9th is graduation. And then finally, June 10th is a senior all-night party. If you guys have any questions, I can take them now. Otherwise, I have a question. Mm -hmm. First of all, we really appreciate you making time to come in and provide an update to the board and to the community. Um, so thank you for making time uh, on a Monday evening to do this. Yeah, you're welcome. It's nice when we have an opportunity to interact with students like yourself. Um, and I often am curious, when you think of, a, I notice on the back is a, is a senior graduating in the class of 2023, and you, you reflect back on your experience going through Brighton Area Schools, what was the most influential um, moment in the school, a lab, a class? Yeah. What do you feel looking back had the most profound impact on your learning experience while you were in our school system? Great question. So um, starting out like in elementary school, it was great and it really blessed me with a lot of things. But I think that it really started making an impact on like my character once I got to high school. And then we have like a great staff at the high school. We got a couple people in attendance here. But like the teachers that really show compassion to the students and show them that they care and that school is not more than it's it's more than just a like a letter grade or what you get on your report card or what college you're going to so i'd say that it's a great staff that we have at the high school that really just makes high school a really special place and a place where i seen a lot of growth in my past well i'm sure all of the staff uh, in the high school appreciate hearing that thank, thank you Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Thank guys. You, Josh. And uh, Josh, is that your last meeting? You'll be a graduate next month. I'll come to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk then. So um, the next group that we're going to recognize here is we, we have several groups at the high school that do uh, amazing work. And um, as Josh was talking about, you know, education is about more than just teaching and learning. It's also about service, giving back to others, and it's something that's been a priority for our staff, um, especially for our student groups. And one of the groups that's really invested in this is our National Honor Society. They were recognized. Um, I'm going to share a video clip here right now, and then I'm going to bring forward some of our National Honor Society folks that are going to uh, talk to us about some special things that they've been involved with. donations are doubled today so this is a great day to call i want to introduce you to some pretty cool high school students they're from brighton high school and they're in the national honor society we have sammy grace and their advisor and teacher ms anderson you guys are true hunger heroes tell me a little bit about what you did to raise money and food for gleaners yeah so pretty much at the high school everyone wants to give back to their community because you never know what someone who's food insecure could look like and so brian has this fun competition between teachers where they'll trash talk each other and the winner uh, the winning class gets a prize and it's just a great way for the school to become involved and the, com the friendly competition is a great way to just encourage people to bring in more donations to help out the community yeah tell me about that it's between schools but it's also between different classrooms right yeah so at our school our teachers are 
getting those bragging rights every time they really are striving to win. There's a trophy that we hand out and that is something that we do at the beginning of the year and they want those bragging rights for the rest of the year. We even had one classroom this year that organized a bottle drive on the weekend because they fell behind in our competition this year. They really wanted that win and they came out with it. I love the determination here. It's fantastic. So tell me, how much did you guys raise? We raised $21,000 this year for Gleaners. And that translates into tens of thousands of meals for hungry families in need. Let's talk to the advisor. I hear uh, there's some trash talk going on. Uh, what can you say about that? Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's the best way to get the kids <laughs> and the teachers involved. But really, it's more about understanding that you never know what um, the situation is of the student sitting next to you. And that's kind of what we like to talk about most. And I think that's the biggest influencer with the kids and the classrooms is, you know, how much of an impact can they have? And it's direct impact, not only on Livingston County, but, you know, on all of Southeast Michigan. And it really seems like they're taking that seriously. Tell me why you wanted to help other kids. It's kind of hard to imagine that you're sitting in class mm -hmm. with other people that are hungry and you don't even know it. Yeah. So actually we were introduced to Gleaners through one of our uh, teachers at the high school who volunteers there on the weekends. And after Sammy and I went in with him one weekend and volunteered there, stocking shelves and everything, it really opened our eyes to all the people in the community that could be struggling. Is he here today? He is not. Okay, there's another teacher here that's here. Yes, we have one of our other NHS advisors here, Mr. Carney. He wanted to say hi to him because he came in. <laughs> well, it's amazing what you guys are doing and keep up the great work. Hopefully you can pass that down to students as they move up uh, in high school. And we're just very proud of you guys and all that you've accomplished. Uh, you can accomplish a lot too by calling today. Your dollar goes right. twice as far to help feed hungry so I'm going to bring forward Sammy and our group here. Great job. Hi, everyone. My name is Sammy Mullet. I'm president of NHS this year. And with me, I have Josh Slada. He was a member of the Gleaners Committee. And then over there, we have Mr. Carney and Ms. Anderson, our senior or our NHS advisors. And then, unfortunately, Grace Przicki, the other girl you saw in the video, couldn't be with us today due to a college visit. But I just wanted to come up here and talk to you all about Gleaners a little bit more. So as Grace mentioned in the video, we raised over $21,000 this year for Gleaners, which is an amazing contribution. <laughs> and actually, we learned when we were there that... so. We have won Hungry Heroes, which is a competition set up by Gleaners the past few years, and they actually ended up having to change the rules. After we won two or three years in a row, they had to broaden the reward or the prize to instead of the top school getting it, they had to broaden it to the top three or five schools because Brighton just kept winning year after year, which is a testament to just how much Brighton wants to give back to the community and make an impact on it. And yeah, and then real quick too, I want to give a shout out to Mr. McMahon, who Grace was talking about. He was my Spanish teacher the past four years, and he introduced me to Gleaners and helped get me and Grace and make us want to help our community and help out with Gleaners. So just a special shout out to him if he's watching. And now here's Josh Seda. Thank you for that transition. So hi, my name is Josh. Uh, as Sam mentioned, I'm part of the Gleaners Food Drive Committee at the high school. And I think the food drive is one of the best traditions we have at the high school. And especially since it reaches down to our younger schools, I have a lot of memories of it. It's always been a big part of the school, a big part of kind of the culture. It's one of those competitions that kind of everybody wins at, even though there are some teachers that will be very apt to tell you that there was only one winner and it's them, such as Ms. Hopped, our health teacher. She tends to win it a lot. She won this year. And I think as gleaners and ourselves recognize there's nothing better than kind of the friendly spirit of competition to prompt raising a lot of money for a good cause. And I think we've kind of nailed down the art of doing that to just generate crazy profits every year to go to a good cause, even though it's not for a lack of effort. We had multiple 650, 645 morning meetings before school meeting after school to count money and whatnot. We had several little subcommittees within our own 
uh, such as marketing, accounting, all that stuff to kind of get around. We made partnered with Mr. Coney's graphics class to make posters to just more further advertise it throughout the school. You really couldn't turn a corner without it staring you in the face. So I think we've really accomplished a lot this year and I'm very proud to say I was part of that. So So thank you board members and everyone for letting us be here. And if you guys have any questions, we'd love to try and answer them. Well, I, I want to, on behalf of the board, I, I want to commend, I don't have a question, I want to commend you for all of your efforts. Um, I think that year in and year out, uh, the efforts that the National Honor Society puts in um, is, is incredibly impactful for our community. Um, it, it really positively affects so many lives, whether it's gleaners, um, whether it's veterans, it, we, you know, we've, every year there's a very well-deserved uh, group um, that benefits from all of your uh, hard work. And, and as, the, as the board, we're very proud of all that you do, all of the students, all of their efforts, all of the staff members and advisors, thank you for all of the extensive time that you put into this great program. Um, it, and it, it, it's a testament to not only uh, the hard work, but the leadership. I mean, it's, it's as wildly successful as it is because of the young leaders that you have already become and that you will build on and carry forward um, uh, in the future. And so a very heartfelt congratulations to all of you for all of your hard work. Um, and uh, we look forward to the amazing future that um, you have in store for you as graduates of Brighton Area Schools. So thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank you. I have a presentation, so I'm, I'm going to do it from up here so that I can, so that everybody can see what I got, what I have on the screen here. So, uh, on uh, at the end of each week, I used to do an update for the Board of Education. In this past week, I was going to share some information regarding safety and security, and I thought that it might be appropriate for us to uh, to talk about it here in our in our meeting here. So. Um, in the spring of 2021, uh, working closely with Officer Bell, we began uh, a safety security overhaul as a district. Uh, in the spring, uh, we started looking at procedures, protocols, looking at training. We started working on enhancing, really trying to work, uh, move the district forward as it relates to safety and security. In December of, um, of 2021, I, we had had a terrible tragedy in Oxford. And we pulled together a group of people, a full commission, advisory commission that included active law enforcement, retired law enforcement, private security experts, somebody from the state safety commission, uh, Brighton parents, Brighton administration and staff. And we have been working ever since to um, make Brighton area schools the safest place it can be for students, staff, and everyone who's here in our buildings. So uh, we met weekly during the 21-22 school year, and this year we've been meeting one time a month, and I'm really proud of the work that this team has been able to do. Uh, we had five main areas that we've really been focused on. One is preparedness, two was staffing, three was facilities, four was prevention, and fifth was response. When it comes to preparedness, that had a lot to do with the safety protocols and security protocols that we had as a district. Uh, Officer Bell and Deputy Schuster have led our staff to go through the alert, deny, defend, not just the initial training, but refreshers and tabletop exercises where staff has put those uh, best practices in place. Um, we've improved our drills as a district. Um, we, we've been taking them more seriously, uh, but we've also been modifying um, conditions so that people have to think and have to adapt. And uh, when it comes to staffing, one of the big things, the Board of Education was very supportive of us adding a second police liaison, which is at Scranton. So thank you so much for that. That's going really well. And then uh, through a company called Premier Security, we hired six retired police officers. So in all of our K-12 buildings, we have an officer in every building. Um, again, thank you to the Board of Education for doing that, okay, for supporting that. The facility work, uh, this is, again, a team effort. Uh, 
Officer Bell and Deputy Schuster work closely with our operations staff on everything from cameras, PA systems, alert systems, key, key access, door number and communication systems, and on and on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about more about this in just a moment. Prevention is a major piece of this, dealing with mental health and wellness as a district. That is a major pillar of our district. Uh, we added two additional mental health staff members, one at Maltby, one at Scranton. Again, thank you to the Board of Education for your support. And then partnering with parents really around this concept of see and hear something, say something, about working together to help students that are in distress, being proactive, uh, you know, okay to say, uh, resource, parent coaching, parent university. It's really wrapping around this idea of helping students be as healthy as they can um, uh, on the wellness side of things. Then in response, that's an important part, uh, the protocols for, for addressing students that are in distress as well as communication protocols. So those are some of the things that we've been working on. Just to give you a quick update, last uh, Thursday, our commission, uh, we met last week and uh, we made some plans for the fall. And also we're looking at some of the operational things. So I wanted to share what those things are. One, the training for 23, 24 school year. Uh, there's gonna be some training for staff. Some of it's refresher. Again, tabletop exercises, going to that next level there. Um, that will continue. That will be part of the training in the fall. Uh, the drills for uh, 23, uh, 23, 24. Again, we're gonna continue with that. What we're looking at doing is an evacuation drill during the week of September 25th. That's where students would exit the building and we kind of talk through uh, that piece. Um, there, the procedures and protocols are constantly revised and we have people going to what's called the CEPLA conference. Our officers go to this, our retired officers are gonna be going to this. Several of our principals went last year and are going again this year. And it's the most up-to-date best practices for school when it comes to safety and security. So probably coming back from that, there may be more revisions on our practices as a district. We have a grant, uh, Section 97 grant as a district, and this comes from state funding. And so we have a sizable amount of money that we can spend. We have about a year to spend that. And uh, we're going to be coming back to the uh, facility committee, um, as well as the Board of Education with some ideas around improving safety uh, from the facility, facility perspective. Uh, camera work, we're looking at having secure vestibules in each one of our buildings. Hawkins, Horning, Maltby, Scranton are all buildings that are in need with card swipes and a couple tweaks there. We're looking at security film for all of our windows. Uh, we have a bid for one building, but we would like to do that district-wide. Um, continued work on doors, communication devices. We have people working on what's called critical incident mapping, which helps police and fire and everybody be able to respond. So that work is going on. And then the last piece that we're working on is our uh, medical staff as a district, our nurses and medical assistants are working on training for staff. And then second, they're also working on having things like triage kits so that people have the things that they need if there's ever an injury that they may have to assist with. So um, just wanted to give everybody an update on what's going on here. Teaching and learning, that's our, that's our bread and butter. That's what we do for a living. But safety and security is something that we spend a lot of time on. We take this very seriously and we're very committed to making the Brighton Area Schools the safest it can be for everybody involved. So I want to say thank you to all those team members. Thank you to Officer Bell, Deputy Schuster, all of our officers that keep us safe every day. Uh, thank you to the board for your support for all of these initiatives. And thank you to the community for your partnership. Thank you so much. All right. That moves us uh, to the call to the public portion of our agenda. Uh, if there is anyone here this evening that would like to address the board, this is your opportunity to do so. Um, our protocol is to, is to ask everyone to fill out a card uh, and the, uh, right, right, Mr. Ritter, I'll give you an exemption. I'll, I'll exercise, I'll exercise. Uh, I'm gonna agree, yeah, there you go. Great grandfather. I'll grant you an exemption. Um, but I would ask that anyone uh, that would like to address the board, fill out a card, uh, place it in the uh, box there on the table. Uh, you will have three minutes to address the board. Um, Ms. Marks will be keeping track of your time. Uh, when there are 30 seconds left in your allotted time, she will hold up a yellow card. And when your three minutes um, have expired, she will hold up the red card. Uh, and so without further ado, Mr. Ritter, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Well, I come to you tonight as the president of the Brighton Alumni Association. It's the BASAA, Brighton Area Schools Alumni Association. It was founded in 1986 to commemorate the 100 year anniversary of Brighton Area Schools. The first president was Tom Leith, followed by Suzanne Conaway. So in 37 years, we've had three presidents take over this role. Some of the things that we have currently are, first of all, to Dr. Outlaw, we have the Distinguished Alumni Wall of Fame at Brighton High School. Last year, we had three inductees. This year, there'll be two new inductees in the Distinguished Wall of Fame. We also have the Alumni Hall, which uh, Principal Gavin Johnson has given us permission to display all graduating photos from this uh, senior class from 1906 to 2023. They're all on display in the Alumni Hall at the Brighton High School. We also have the alumni room located in Brighton High School with lots of memorabilia. When some kids come down there, they can't get out. They just love to see the history of a Brighton schools. We also have the alumni dinner. This year it'll be July 16th at Mount Brighton. Any alumni, any non-alumni is welcome to come to that. And we also do scholarships. This year we gave out 10 $1,000 scholarships. We've granted in the last 37 years $130,000. Worth, uh, worth of scholarships to graduating seniors. And this year we are looking forward to June uh, 9th when the class of 1973 will come back for their 50 year diploma. It's quite a memorable uh, evening for that class. There'll be 22 members receiving their golden diploma that night. And uh, those scholarships sometimes are funded by previous classes, class of 62, class of 63, class of 65, class of 71 has donated money. Families have donated money. So I kind of urge the class of 2023 to remember 50 years from now in 2073, will you give back? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ritter. So what year did you graduate from Brighton High? I'm a 1971 grad. And how many years did you teach for us? 43. Yeah, pretty remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and that's the proof in the pudding right there. He was one of my athletes and students. <laughs> him and him and her and her and her. Yeah. It all goes back to Mr. Stratton, but we could go on and on and on. I think Roger will give you, you can do whatever you want there, because I think Roger will forgive whatever you want to talk about. Any other questions about the Alumni Association? Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jason Ringett. And then the next uh, person after Mr. Mr. Ringett will be Anna Wells. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, let your Holy Spirit fill this room, soften everyone's hearts. Let us work together with peace and compassion and with kind words towards each other. Let us not be rude or uncivil towards one another. Bless the school board with wisdom and discernment. It's time that we start opening up our school board meetings with prayer, giving praise and glory to God and blessing our schools. I find it amazing that the right school district bends the knee to the Rainbow Mafia, having pedophilia, grooming, LGBTQ safe space signs hanging up within the schools, which violates Article 1, Section 26 of the Michigan Constitution, discriminating against the other 99% of the students and staff who do not agree with the lifestyle, making kids second-guess their sexuality and destroying our kids' innocence is a crime. How many hate crime shootings have been committed by trans extremists in the past year. Normal healthy adults do not get angry that they cannot talk to five to nine year olds about sex. Predators and perverts do. Brighton School District needs to take a stand against the woke leftist extremists who are promoting and supporting perverts and pedophilias who are sick and twisted who want to normalize math, known as minor attractive person and drag queen crap in public schools. Anyone supporting or promoting MAP or Drag Queen Story Hour within Brighton schools need to be criminally prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Men cannot be women. Changing pronouns, playing dress up, cutting off genitals doesn't make you a woman. Never did, never will. Somehow I am a hateful Christian for stating the obvious. Standing up for God's design, male and female, doesn't make me a hateful Christian. Just because you feel offended, if you're offended, take it up with God or science. Male trans cannot get pregnant. When testing DNA, how many genders does it detect? I'm not going to pretend the lies are true just for the sake of not offending anyone. 
I will not be twisting facts just because you might take offense. My kids have the same rights as anyone else to talk about their Christian beliefs in Jesus Christ. Even the Bible, demons refer to themselves as them, they, we, and us. Bright schools may want to get their legal team involved in how many obscene, explicit sexual books are currently in Brighton schools right now. Anyone complaining about anyone banning books in Brighton schools, just calm down. The U.S. Department of Justice website discusses obscenity. It states the following, federal law strictly prohibits distribution of obscene matter to minors. That is what federal law says about obscenity. Any transfer to a minor under the age of 16, including over the Internet, is punishable under federal law. Policy committee needs to understand that it's important for school board members to have the same immediate access to tell all the schools just like Dr. Outlaw has. Not playing games on making restrictions on school board members. It's important for our school board members to be able to walk around and interact with students and teachers at their choosing to build personal relationships with students and staff to find out what works and what doesn't work within our schools. Also making sure that there are no shenanigans going on within our schools. The committee needs to boot the union out of the high school it's a Trojan horse that supports left-wing radical ideas and radical agendas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anna Wells. And after Anna Wells will be Elizabeth Crane. Hi there. I'm Anna Wells and I'm from the Novi School District, but I've been teaching in Brighton for the last 20 five-ish years, the last six, as the media specialist at Hawkins Elementary. Thanks to the support of the Brighton community who voted to approve the, our last bond, our elementary libraries underwent some exciting renovations over the summer of 2022. As a part of the renovation, STEAM classrooms were designed, and this evening, I would like to share with you some of the work that our elementary STEAM teachers have done to transform these classrooms from simple physical spaces to creative and collaborative workshops for our students. As the media specialist working basically in the adjacent classroom to our STEAM teacher, Sarah Tork at Hawkins, I have had a front row seat to the students in junior kindergarten through fourth grade engaging in the design and engineering process. Junior kindergarten and kindergarten students have explored a variety of building materials, have recycled crayons, and have created things like noisemakers and fans and wrecking balls. First and second graders have solved science mysteries by identifying the properties of substances and observing chemical changes. They have designed and built better pack backpacks as they learned that engineers not only invent new things, but make existing technologies better. They have also begun thinking like computer scientists as they learned to code digital nursery rhymes and their own original stories. Third and fourth graders have been up to a lot as well. Through the study of spiders, they have learned the differences between inherited and learned behaviors. They have created models of spider webs and explored how spiderlings inherit traits from their spider parents. They have studied electrical currents and have designed unique night lights to demonstrate their understanding. And they have built some pretty cool balloon cars with the challenge of having the winning car, the car that would go the farthest. Finally, they have also taken on the role of computer scientists, developing more advanced um, coding skills and coding their own um, video games. As the end of the year, at as the, end, the year ends, all students are observing the chicken life, life cycle as they eagerly learn the stages of development of the 18 eggs in our incubators that are due to hatch next week. Most importantly, I think the students have discovered the inventor's secret within our STEAM curriculum. The inventors fail frequently and often, but they take what they learn from their failures and work hard to turn it into success. I think they are beginning to see that with the help of the teacher, that the inventor's secret is really the learner's secret, and that this concept extends far beyond the STEAM classroom. It has been an eventful year, to say the least, witnessing the transformation of these beautiful, beautiful physical spaces into classroom communities filled with discovery. I have enjoyed displaying much of the student work on the top of the library shelves, especially because they seem to initiate interesting questions and conversations from our students, which essentially is more STEAM thinking. 
Ultimately, for me, I am glad that um, the elementary STEAM program, which originally started in our libraries, is evolving in such a way that allows students a much more in-depth experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Elizabeth Gray. Real quick, can I ask a quick question, Ryan? We should not supposed to interact other than obviously we get they, all, they always coach me not to interact but one of the one of the things that is a passion for everyone up here is steam education and um sure. i think it would be nice to get input at some point from teachers that are involved in the steam program yeah absolutely and that would that would be for a uh, future agenda absolutely for Perfect. all of all the schools okay. absolutely all right um elizabeth crane and uh, Janelle Vermiglio will be next. Good evening. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Crane. I am a parent of a first grader and an incoming kindergartner in the school district there at Spencer. Um, I've been teaching for 15 years and this is my second year teaching in Brighton. I'm at the high school. And I often watch these virtually, but it's nice to be here in person and see all of you in person. Um, as the year is wrapping up, I've just been reflecting on these two years and how in many ways it feels like I've been teaching here for a lot longer than two years because it feels so comfortable already. And I feel like I know the students and the staff and so many administrators so well. Um, and I really think there's something special in this district, which is a multi-layered system of support for the staff. We talk about this a lot, multi-tiered systems of support for our students, but I really felt from the moment I came into this district that the administration, my colleagues, the community, um, and the teachers union were all really working collaboratively towards common goals. And I know that it's easy to focus on our differences or things that we wish that the other groups might do differently or say differently. Um, but creating that sort of collaborative culture takes a long time and a lot of work from a lot of people. And it can also be lost really quickly and is hard to get back. And so I just hope that we can recognize what a great thing we have going and, and work to continue that. Thank you. And after Janelle Vermiglio will be Todd Day. Hello, uh, my name is Janelle Vermiglio and I live here in Brighton. I am the art teacher at Hawkins and also the parent of a wonderful ninth grader at BHS. I'm here tonight to highlight my amazing art team and to invite you to a very special event. Uh, my team and I spent the day Friday working hard to set up our district's junior kindergarten through 12th grade art exhibit. This is the first time we have held a district-wide show in several years. And thanks to the new STEAM Center at the high school, we now have a beautiful and large enough space to host something um, of this size. We are so excited to bring it back and plan to make this an annual event once again. Um, so I would like to formally invite the community, board members, administration, um, the BAS staff uh, to join us this Friday night from 6 to 8 p.m. for our big opening reception. Uh, come and meet your fabulous art team while enjoying thousands of artworks created by our incredible and creative, talented students um, from each and every building, which is pretty cool. Plus, there will be snacks. And the show will be up until May 21st, in case you can't make it to our opening night. Um, I have a flyer for each of you. Thank you to Sean Carney and the graphics department. We have these amazing flyers. And I'll leave extras by the door in case anybody would like one. Um, but thanks so much, and we hope to see you there. After Todd Day will be uh, Sarah, uh, BS teacher. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Hi there. Good evening. I'm Todd Day, a teacher at Brighton High School, former Brighton grad. Wanted to share a few positive things at the high school that are near and dear to my heart that the board and community would benefit knowing about. One is an initiative called REACH. It's an acronym, Raising Everyday Awareness of Comfort and Help. With this initiative, peer mediators are helping promote and highlight the varied resources already available but overlooked at Brighton High School for kids struggling with mental health or any issues they're encountering. Teachers, administrators, counselors, and support staff will be on morning announcements throughout the month to put a face in a location for those who need a listening ear. It sounds simple, but we think students sometimes forget the people around them reaching out when they're fumbling during those dark moments. Another highlight is our literary magazine, which has been on hiatus for a couple of years. It's called Taurus Canis. Um, it's a BHS publication that highlights student creative work, uh, writing, art, you know, pottery, all that stuff. Um, and students submit things throughout the year. It's funded by a local attorney. It's like a one, one person funded thing. Bob Gardella, we love you. And printed through Mr. Carney, once again mentioned, and it's graphics class. It's a special magazine full of talent. And I'm going to leave a couple here just from years past, and I'll get you the new ones. But I think it's like kind of cool to like grab them when you guys go into closed session. You know, people can read something. <laughs> so there you go. I'll have these here. One final note, uh, I was really impressed with my seniors. I teach uh, World Lit at the high school and we had armed forces interviews because during The Things They Carried, it's a book that we read about Vietnam, they, uh, they interviewed family members, friends, coworkers that have served in the armed forces and they heard their experiences firsthand and transcri transcribed their interviews so that future generations can read and know what sacrifice and commitment they, they gave. Um, it's not just something you throw in a PowerPoint and then it's lost to cyberspace. It's print it, put it in a, a, you know, a chest, and then 50 years down the road, people can read about what their grandparent contributed or something. But So Armed Forces Day is coming up on May 20th, but I thought it was a really special assignment and it was really cool. Um, and one final thing, I'm going to put a push, like all of you are welcome into my classroom. I'm an F11 down at Brighton High School. Um, and for the gentleman that spoke at the beginning, you know, I feel like sometimes things are put in a light where it's, scary. it's a scary place, an English classroom or a science classroom nowadays. Um, it's not a scary place. Come in. You're welcome. We welcome you. We want to make it inclusive for everybody, the students, the community, the board, you know. Let's all work together, uh, and let's finish this year stronger together. Thanks. Jennifer Smith will be next. Hi, I'm Sarah Tork. Um, I'm the STEAM teacher at Hawkins. Um, this is my first year as a STEAM teacher because it's the first year we've had them. I, this is my 17th year in Brighton schools, though. Um, and the STEAM at Hawkins, the STEAM lab, is inside of the Media Center. So I have, over the past year, worked very closely with Anna and wanted to share with you some of the amazing things that I've been seeing and learning about our library STEAM centers. Um, I learned that each of the Brighton Area School Libraries holds a special 21st Century Library Accreditation awarded to them by the Michigan Department of Education along with the Library of Michigan. Each library has been awarded exemplary status because they have demonstrated that they have exceeded required benchmarks in the areas of inquiry, engagement, inclusion, exploration, curation, and collaboration. So what does that really mean? It means that our library programs are pretty great, especially because our li elementary libraries have provided a solid foundation for our district's expanding STEAM curriculum. At Hawkins, I see students coming into the library and learning through literacy and technology. They have access to a wonderful collection of books and digital resources, instructional technology, and robotics as part of the library's continued commitment to the district's STEAM vision. Gone are the days where libraries were 
quiet study spaces. Instead, what I see happening in our libraries are students reading books with flashlights and whisper phones, using flexible seating, being comfortable, learning about being responsible digital citizens, collaborating, problem solving, reflecting, and just having a pretty good time in our newly renovated media center. I'm sure that the experiences of the students in other elementary buildings are very similar to these. It seems that our complementary curriculums have endless potential for collaboration, and I look forward to seeing our growth as a district. Thank you. Thank you. After Ms. Smith is uh, Susan Tobolewski, and this is the last card that I have. Is there, are there any others? Oh, one more. Hi, board. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. First of all, um, I didn't know that all these people were going to be here, so thank all the teachers for talking. Um, it's nice to see more than just parents in the seats. And I want to say something about Mr. Carney, who... Um, <laughs> Yes, everyone loves Mr. Carney, but my older son, CJ, loves Mr. Carney. He loves him so much that when I come home from work, I have to text him and ask him where he's at, and he's usually still hanging out with him at 4.30, and I have to say, you know, you have to work an hour, you have to come home. I so, um, so that, are you still alive? Are you out there? <laughs> so I just want to say that that is a testament to um, the love of the teachers here. And um, the, th the thing that I want to talk about, I think, really comes into play with um, what Mr. Day had to say, and that was specifically that we're getting clouded up in these associations. And um, I don't mean to bring something ugly into a really nice evening, but I do think it needs to be said. Y you guys, as a board, you've had a transparency issue. And um, I've been sitting back and I've been watching for the last several meetings and listening to Mr. Storm. And I just, if I could give you a trophy, I would, um, because he um, heralds the voice of, of many, many parents, maybe not all, but many. And that's why he's on the board. That's who we voted him in. So um, I just want to say to the rest of you that don't want to work with him and you 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 are silencing the transparency that is the problem and the problem that i have are your affiliations specifically the masb and the masb is getting ready to push more mumble jumble down your throats and you're all going to have to make a really tough decision because we have a very very extremist Department of Education that's going to pass a resolution tomorrow. I don't know if you've had the time to read it, but it's dangerous for all of our children. So I would hope that those of you, um, before you go making a decision, you really think long and hard about your positions. And you think about this night and how wonderful it was to hear all of these testaments to what is happening in our schools. And you think about how, uh, um, affiliating with these accreditations out there and these entities like the MASB, they are clouding your judgment. And what has happened historically since I've started coming to these meetings for over three years now, th that has clouded your judgment. And that's why some of us are at odds or have been at odds in the past. So um, the final thing is I want to make a comment about this 3105 policy. You should not be limiting access to these buildings to these school board members. There is a reason, and many of these students are my son's friends. They're on teams. They're in classes and clubs with them. They should not, none of you should be limited to any of our buildings. And rubber stamping policies is what you guys got into hot water with before. And um, we will go that route again if you deny them access. Thank you. After Susan T uh, Topoleski will be Jared Alamet. Good evening, board and students especially. I'm glad to see young faces here tonight. Um, I thought this was the last school board meeting of the year, but apparently it's not. So even so, I'm still going to give my words of encouragement. Um, it's been a rough three years for board members, superintendent, students, parents, and teachers alike. And um, in spite of our differences, I just wanted to come here tonight to say that I really, really am hoping and praying for a spirit of cooperation and transparency um, between all entities, because um, our children are what all of this is about. And if we lose sight of that because of egos or arguments or um, agenda-driven reasons, they're the ones who lose out. 
and they're our future. We can't afford that. So I just implore all of you to really take that message to heart. And um, in spite of differences we may have had, I just encourage you all to continue to try to work together, come up with creative solutions, um, put them at the forefront of all that you're doing. And I thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Jared Alamat, Brighton, two kids in the district. I'll be brief tonight, which is unusual. Um, I echo the comments that were made about policy 3105. I actually, when I reflect on the governance process here, um, I take some solace in the fact that we elect you guys. Um, so we get a say in that, right? Like, and we've got awesome teachers, so I would never disparage any of them, but we don't get to necessarily choose them. We entrust you guys to have the governance over the superintendent and the administration to hire everybody, right? But we do have some control. We can't some control over uh, you guys because we vote you in. Um, and I would never, related to policy 3105, I would never want to hinder any of your access. I don't know why we would take a step to restrict that. Um, it takes intention. It seems peculiar, especially in light of the recent decision to have um, the teachers union representatives that are not teachers, but rep union representatives being able to reside in the high school. So it seems that if an unelected person can be allowed to reside in the high school, certainly you would allow the board trustees unfettered access to the high school. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, that closes the call to the public portion of our agenda this evening. Uh, before we transition to the for action, I wanna follow up on a comment Mr. Storm made. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, I appreciate uh, well, I think, you know, it's interesting to me as a new board member, and I've, I've shared this with every one of my peers on this board, all of them. Um, it's been really fascinating as a, as a new member of this board in this community to, um, to just see what it really is like behind the scenes to be part of a school board. Um, people who I've never met in my life um, think a particular way about Andy Storm, and I, I don't know them and they don't know me. And then there are other folks who I know who have positions that maybe I don't necessarily uh, agree with or support. Um, but at the end of the day, we all are here as volunteers to support this community and to support the school district. And if there's one thing that I believe unites us, and maybe we could set up a workshop to kind of talk in more detail about this, it's the comments and, and um, the reference to improving how we educate collectively in Brighton area schools. So providing teachers with the absolute best classroom environments that we can provide them with. Uh, we talked at our last workshop, I've exchanged a lot of communication with many members of the board on ways that we can improve our science classrooms, our labs, um, bringing much more advanced technology into the, into the classroom environments. Um, I went through a number of the STEAM centers with one of my peers on this board in multiple schools and as someone who lives in industry every day, I was blown away And this. I've shared with some board members, this isn't intended to be a knock on anyone. It was eye opening to me how far behind we are as it relates to what's happening in industry today. Um, technology is advancing at warp speed, artificial intelligence we all know is in the news. How can we work together in Brighton area schools to bring technology into the classroom to help all of the teachers we're all committed to that. We all, it unites all of us. And so I would just ask for stakeholders that, that are in our community, teachers, parents, students who come and speak to us. We really truly want your input. And I would ask that you give us an opportunity to work with you and partner with you. And we want to create the absolute best school facilities for teachers to teach in and students to learn in here in Brighton. So thank you, Roger. No, absolutely, and, but to follow up, I, I do think it's a good idea. We've obviously invested heavily, not only you know at all levels really of, of our, our district in the, STEAM, in the STEAM initiatives. We've, we've invested a lot of money and resources and emphasize, I very, very much appreciate uh, the information that was shared this evening uh, during the call to the public, but I agree. I think it would be good if at some point in the future at one of our meetings, 
Um, we have a, a presentation by uh, representatives from the different buildings. I think it would be really helpful for us to see the results and to, you know, really appreciate, um, you know, what what's going, you know, into that that hard work and 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 you know the payoff that our students are receiving. So I, I fully support that. Just having that interaction, the call to the public, really. I just I think it's it'll be more helpful I for like us. Interacting with people and thank you. I get it. Yeah, I understand. So, Dr. Alwa, I think that would be. Um, I know we're getting towards the end of this school year, but I think if we, if there was a, a meeting that we could fit it in before the end of the year, obviously we've got existing students that have been, um, you know, very much engaged in that this year, and it would be great to hear their successes and you know continue to build on that as we as we plan for the future. So, thank you for coming this evening and sharing that and lighting a spark for us to uh, to continue sharing that that great that, that, that great story. So, all right. Uh, that moves us to the for action portion of our agenda. Uh, the first item is uh, item A, regular meeting minutes of April 10, 2023. Do we have a motion to approve? Moved we'll by Dr. Krabs. Support. Support by Mr. Conley. Any discussion? So, Roger, I have yeah. just a quick question. Sure. I brought it up at a prior board meeting, I think a few prior board meetings. Where in our meeting minutes do we capture the I don't know what the right term is, unofficial action items that we bring up during the course of our meeting that we had mentioned STAR would record. So there's no misunderstanding about what we are asking Dr. Outlaw for help with in the administration. I, I, as I've looked through these minutes, I, I don't know where that is. And I just want to make sure we talked about it and kind of all nodded our head and agreed to it. Where is that captured? Well, I th the, the pro it's really more of the process of where you captured. I mean, obviously, um, Ms. Akramite prepares the draft minutes. She's been doing that for years. The minutes um, in the in the format and the substance are really follow what are considered to be best practices to the extent that any board member would like to have more detailed information. That's really where it kind of falls back on us. If there's something in particular that we want to to either address with greater specificity, because it, it's hard for her. I mean, if she was to, you know, take a verbatim transcript, I mean, you know, each of our mi minutes would be yeah, super long. No, I, no, and I know I'm not suggesting it is. My point is that, you know, it, it, for Ms. Akramite to, you know, to, you know, to include what specifically maybe one or more of us want to have addressed is difficult for her. And this is really where that is the opportunity for us to say in uh, the, the agenda, the minutes that are presented with regard to this item in the superintendent report, we talked about, you know, adding this to a future meeting, or I'd like that reflected specifically in the minutes. That's really, that way then we can all talk about it. We can say, yep, we, 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 re, you know, we had a consensus on that. I thought we had talked through this and agreed on what would work. And I, I don't want to waste a bunch of time. We, I can talk to you offline about it. But sure. I, I guess do other board members recall that conversation? And was that something that we did collectively agree would be okay? It wasn't anything contentious, I don't believe. No, no, not at all. It's no, really a matter of what we... And I think too, though, into the Rogers, you know, support and also for stars that if we have things specific, like I brought up a couple of things, I asked her to add them back in the minutes that I thought was important that they were memorialized. There's that. And then like you're saying about Andy, it's more future minded stuff as well, not just for historic, but what are we going to do? What are we building on? And how do we go from here as a launch pad? And I think if you even bring it up during the meeting that you'd like it recorded, the minutes would be appropriate. Okay. If we're discussing it, I think, and then it gets to the minutes. Like, has so I'll make a note, and then in the future, yeah, and, and, the minutes yeah. are presented. We can talk. No, and that, well, that's a good that's a good point, so John. I, I, I and I mean, as a practical matter, if you know, in any of us say you know to to provide a um, sort of a heads up to Miss Akramite, I would specifically like this included in the minutes. That might be a helpful, you know, and then that might be captured then sure, yeah. specifically. Uh, when they're drafted. Sounds so, good. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. Uh, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Any nays? That passes 6 0. That moves us to the special meeting minutes of April 13, 2023. Do we have a motion to approve? Moved by uh, Dr. Krebs. Support. Support by Ms. Marks. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Any nays? That passes 6 0. Moves us to the uh, item C, the special meeting minutes of May 1, 2023. Uh, do we have a motion to approve those minutes? Moved by Dr. Krebs. Support. By Ms. Marks. Any discussion? 
All right, all those in favor signify by aye. Aye, aye. any nays, that passes 6-0. That moves us to item D, the Brighton Community Ed Senior Center Vehicle Accessibility Plan. Um, who's gonna talk about that, Dr. Alla? We talked about this for future action. This is a, an annual update for MDOT related to the Senior Center and uh, access. So there's, all right, any concerns? Let me know. We have a motion to approve the accessibility plan. So Moved by Mr. Trombley, support. supported by Mr. Connolly. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Any nays? That passes 6-0. Moves us to item E, the Troon policies 3105, 3116, and 3304 second reading. Mr. Scaling? Yes, I need to provide a brief summary for these. These were presented at the last meeting for review, and they are for action today. Uh, 3105 is a recommended language around visitors and background checks. That was discussed at the policy committee meeting. 3304 is updated language on use of the school facilities recommended by the policy committee. And 3316 is updated language from Troon, uh, adding a section of that describes the use of personal electronic devices by students and staff during state mandated assessments. All right, can I just do one quick clarifier on that? Um, there was a little bit of confusion about what 3105 is. Uh, 2302 was the policy that I think people were concerned about with access to the building. 3105 is about background checks and it's ensuring that there were no gaps in who has to get background checked to be in the presence of children. So again, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Dr. L, I shared this in our policy committee meeting and, and it goes to the so comment. Andy, Andy, let's can we get a motion and then have the debate. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So do we have a motion to approve the policies as presented? So moved. Moved by Mr. Trombley, scored by Dr. Krebs. So in our, in our policy committee meeting that we just had on last Monday, um, I had mentioned in, in th this, I don't recall, I may be mistaken, but I don't remember getting a copy of this in the policy committee meeting, this, right? Yeah, we, this, this was at the policy committee the, meeting. This, the, this? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we talked about the district maintains sole discretion to just revoke building access permissions and identification badges. I don't remember. <laughs> When we were going through with um, Ms. Reed, the language, this was the language that we were modifying? Yeah, we, the administration has not changed anything. I, so this, the, this what, is all I, I'm just asking. What was the language that we modified on the computer screen in the back of the room? It was not this. What was it? We um, were adding in to oh, the... 20, 2302 was the one that you're referencing, right. which is, that's not, that's that's not a... So, yeah. so when... When this is highlighted, I'm just asking, when was this presented and modified in the policy committee meeting? So I'd, I'd have to look at the minutes. The minutes are on the website. All of our policy committee meetings are. This has been talked about at a few of the policy committee meetings. Yep, I don't, and I then don't the that. policy committee moved this forward for future action at the last meeting. Um, so this wasn't actually discussed at the last policy meeting because this had already been approved and had come to the full board at the last meeting. I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is, and I express this concern this past Monday, is that there needs to be a mechanism in place for us to be able to establish. When we met Monday, Chad was in the meeting, and he referenced the policy manual online in tied back language that we were modifying back pointed back to the policy online not physical hard copies in our hand. And I had expressed concern then, and I'm expressing this concern publicly, that there, there needs to be a mechanism in place where, I mean, for folks that are in the public, I mean, this, this is the board deck. I agree we get it ahead of time. We need a mechanism to be able to ensure that there's no gamesmanship that happens with regards to the way the policies are pointing back and forth to each other. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm suggesting that it's, it's of concern to me. I expressed that during our policy committee meeting and I'm expressing it publicly today in front of the, the community. It's concerning to me. It's my, well, I, I feel like I, it's kind of hard to be discussing this without Ms. Reed here. This is something. I mean, I, I will say this, um, having been here, th these, the ability to cross-reference these is 
infinitely better than it was under the NEOLA policies. Yeah. The NEOLA policies were an absolute nightmare, in my opinion, trying to cross-reference back to, I mean, it was just so convoluted. I, I, I'm just sharing that from, you know, for perspective. Yeah, maybe. no, I, I mean, and, and I, I've said this multiple times as a new member of the school board. We go to a policy committee meeting. We sit in front of that projector down there. There is a paragraph up on that screen that we're wordsmithing and modifying and all agreeing that we, we're comfortable with the language. And then in that conversation, we ask Chad a question and point to an online policy manual and it refers back to a policy number. We pull the policy number up and I expressed this to the policy committee and again said I would express this in a public forum. There needs to be a mechanism where we can find a, a basic, simple, easy control mechanism that ensures all members of the policy committee meeting and members of administration are aligned on what language is being modified and really being addressed before we ultimately walk out of the room. Because as an example for this past Monday, the little paragraph that we really modified and worked on that pointed back to an, a related policy, our whole focus was on the language in a, in a three or four line paragraph but I express concern that I'm worried it's a backdoor attempt to point to another policy that puts restrictions on board members' ability to be active in our district, all of them. So that's my comment. Mr. Trolley? So again, going back to this, and if you review 2302, which is a board code of ethics, what is it under number 17 or 18, it says follow policy 3105 as it would be required by any visitor or volunteer when district premises. So you're telling me that the board members need to check in with the principal, just like any other normal visitors would do. So again, does that go back to the point that anybody from this administration office that has a badge is a lot, needs to go in and check in with the principal as well if they're there? Does that mean that, um, you know, we can't walk in a separate door without going through and telling the principal we're there first. That's not what Troon's originally policy was from what I believe. I believe Troon's policy was that if you had, if you passed your eye check and you had a badge, you were able to go into schools. I'd like to know who modified this policy further. Did anybody modify this further or rewrite this policy? Well, first of all, when you say so this policy, the, the, the policy that you talked about with regard to checking in with, yes. that's not in this policy. This is 2303 is for future action. This oh. policy. But, but 2303, is, isn't that the code of ethics? The board's code right. of ethics? Yeah. Yeah. Right, but it refers back to this policy that we're talking about right now, right? Number 18? It does. 2302 refers back that's to, right. in general terms, in addition to being a visitor. Right. So, right. So following the same. So again, same why are we as a board member considered a visitor? If we have a badge and we can come in, why are we considered a visitor? And and again, that's not what Troon's originally original policy said, was it? Was it was this policy modified? Thirty one oh five. Are we talking about now? Or are we going back to twenty three? Well, I'm talking about number eighteen of, on twenty three oh two. Yeah. We we we. The policy committee looked at that to edit those words in the board of ethics. Yes. So I don't, I mean, I've been on the board for as long as Mr. Storm. So I'm not sure historically, but what was approved before this would be an additional add. So what is the reason policy. for this then in regards to board members? Well, I'll just tell you from my perspective, from being in the discussions, 3105, the policies about visiting and background checks were really trying to tighten up gaps and just apply consistent security measures across entrance to the buildings in the district. So that if there were an emergency or something that might come up, we know exactly who's in the building at any given time. While we have the cards, if you're using a card to come in the back, that's not a real time knowledge of who's in the building because we well, don't have a continuous stream of I, cards, unless I'm mistaken, right? The, the card swipe system, if that doesn't alert officers. Are you officer talking balance. about a card swipe in the back door? Or are you talking about Raptor? I'm talking about the card swipe coming in the back door. That certainly alerts officers. Yeah, the card swipe badge. 
But that alerts Officer Bell on coming in that door in real time, right? Bill say it's bouncing off a database to grant you access. Right, because she knows. She can look at the camera. She can see that someone's coming in that back door. And if it and if that isn't the case, I'd have to question the security around that if that's not the case. But wouldn't that alert her that someone's coming in that back door? I don't know the real time. I mean, our our really our discussion was not to impede well, access. It was really about ensuring that there was consistent security measures and that someone in the building knew if you or I were to be in there and there was an emergency, they would be aware that there's an additional person in the building that needed to be evacuated, attended no, to, No, honestly, cetera. in respect to Gavin Johnson with 2,000 kids, I hope I'm the last one he worries about being in that building. I hope he worries well, about I, I, I respect first. what you're saying, but- Okay, so I, I don't understand the rationale of him knowing that I'm in the it's building. It's not him per se like necessarily, it would be anyone. It's just applying that same standard. Okay, but standard. When, when I swipe my card, that says I'm coming in that door, right? There's a record, there's a time, and if someone wants to know, right there it is, right? And I'm a certainly, and maybe Officer Bell's here or not, but I'm assume that alerts someone's coming in that door when that card is flipped. So again, I think this is directly related to John and I coming into these facilities when we come in to look to see the condition of these facilities. And again, limiting us to being able to walk in when we want to walk in. And I think that's a shame. And I'd like to know, Again, who modified this policy? Was this the administration? Was this the policy committee? Who rewrote this this policy and put this in place? So th this was not written by administration. This was brought to the policy committee by a member, and um, by a member one of the board. So policy committee, one of one of the members. I think you, I think Miss I think Miss yeah I think Miss I think Miss Reed wrote the initial draft and brought that to you all to uh, talk about that at the last meeting. So, so um, this policy 3105, this, this policy 3105, again, this was modified by board members, not by the administration. And that was the initial, and this was to address those gaps in background checks. Again, the board wrote these, this was done by the policy committee, brought forward to the full board, you know, at the last meeting for future action. So the, these are, these are board, recommendations so just to be clear okay so again tell me what are the gaps we're missing in the background <laughs> well look see, if, if i may if i may yeah. so as as i understand it and i'm not part of the policy committee but nor am i the policy committee put together the proposed revisions which are highlighted and or stricken in 31 the three that are up for approval tonight 3105 3116 and 3304 those were reviewed and proposed by the the as i understand it from the policy committee they were then up for future action at our last meeting i mean right. so this these entire these entire policies were with the language was was for us to review and discuss yeah. if we had an issue with it yeah there were no concerns that were raised last time but this it, is hold on hold on for discussion i understand and that's why we're having it so now 22 the 22 oh the 2302 as i understand it is what you're talking about which isn't up tonight the the 2302 is up for future action which if approved at the next meeting would then would then cross reference the information that's contained in 3105 yeah. so for example the first paragraph of 3105 the district the language that's been added is the district maintains sole discretion to issue or revoke building access permissions and or identification badges that may be used to access district facilities OK, if we approve this tonight, yep. that's not applicable to board members. OK, because we haven't we it's haven't. A, no, because so we haven't applied to board members. Because we only if we adopt 2302 at the next meeting, will this apply to, to board members? So what this does is this gives the this, if somebody comes in and wants to volunteer or be a visitor and they run a swipe and there's something in their back in their criminal background mm -hmm. history that causes concern to the administration, this gives the district the sole discretion to do that, okay. to deny them the ability. It doesn't apply to board members if this gets approved unless 2302 gets approved at the meeting in two weeks. Is that That's my understanding. Without additional language, right. I guess. So there's the potential that those, you know, that there could be different definition of, of what we're calling a visitor. So who decided to put it in 23? So, so just a point of clarification. Yes. Um, I sit on the policy committee meeting in that chair right over there, we present up on that little drop down in the back. 
Dr. Outla, have uh, maybe I should ask my peer on the policy committee meeting who's here. I have never seen, prior to walking into a policy committee meeting, the proposed modification to language that ultimately is on the screen when we walk into a policy committee meeting. Have you seen it before we walk into the meeting? I've um, never received a copy via email from anyone. We walk through the door, sit down at the table, and the new proposed language is up on the screen, and I've never seen it prior to the meeting. And so well, who, who, who creates? I'm saying that the language that's modified on the screen, when we walk into the policy committee meeting last Monday, the pink highlighted language that was up in the paragraph on the wall. Did you see that prior to the meeting? I did not. Um, I, I would have to go back and look through my email. I believe it was distributed in email, but I, I can't say 100% one way or the other, so I'd have to check. Yeah, that. so I, I've, I've, I've not received copies of the modified language prior to the policy committee meeting. Sure. And so I, I say that in the context of Bill's question on who is proposing the change in language? So I don't, we don't have back and forth dialogue as a board prior to the policy committee meeting about language changes it's on, the, on the board we walk in. So I'll give an example of 3105, so with the visitors. So from the administrative side, we brought the 3105 as it existed. We didn't modify it at all, but we had it in a format where you all could say, these are ideas and suggestions. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, this so we brought this in, part. we put it up on the screen and then at the board members, you talked about things that gaps. Mm -hmm. You said, I'm worried about this language. And then we literally just typed and we walked through and you all walked through it. And we just assisted yeah. with the development of that policy. So the policy ahead of time, I would have said 3105 is the policy. It's, it's in our, you know, it's in our database, but this was created by the board policy committee at the meeting, for example. So then, um, so we literally right up, you know, we modified it. And the last meeting, 210 or 2302, for example, that went up on the board, there was some ideas that were put out by one of the board. But board, the, board members. the proposed language so, was already, when we started the meeting, yeah. the proposed language was on the board. And Bill's question is, where yeah. did that proposed language come from? So those were suggestions. By and then we, we already we already said who it was a it was one of member of the board said, here's some ideas. Here's some ideas. Okay. And her, in her defense, she's not here, but she brought it up as ideas. She said, this is a gap. Let's talk about this. And she was open about it. And the board member said, I'm concerned about that language. And we struck this and we changed the language and we modified it several times as it went through. And literally board members, you guys all talked about it. Ms. So Ms. Reed has been very, I, I've, I have nothing absolutely. but this is what she does positive constructive things to say right. about the way we've been able to interact with Ms. Reed right. at the policy committee meeting. Yeah. Bill's question was, where did the proposed language changes come from? Right. And and so board members. So a board member, not board well, members. On 2302, but 3105 was a collective effort. There were, you know, after the fact. We're we're now twisting facts back and no, forth. No, no. I'm I had no I, I'm on the policy committee, Dr. Ola. So you, I had I have did not receive the proposed language changes prior to the meeting. The language that was proposed was up on that board when I walked into the meeting. Is that, is that, are you disputing that? Are you, are you talking about 2302 or are you talking are you, about this? Are you disputing what I just said? So last Monday. But on Monday's meeting was already, was written by a board member, not by administration. And she put that up correct. on the screen. Up on the screen when yeah. I walked into the meeting. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, so you do agree with me? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Again, I, I don't have an issue for the visitors, but then again, how to roll into 2302 or the next thing, who, who put it on there in the future? So here, here's what I would suggest, yeah. and especially since Ms. Reed isn't even here. I would suggest that we amend, well, first of all, I guess, is there, we've talked a lot about 3105. Is there any issues with 3116 and 3304? Does anybody have an issue or want to? Here's, here's what happened. Started researching it and looking at what we're doing for future. And then I tied it back into the policy we're going to adopt tonight. I didn't have an issue with it initially until I read what we were going to adopt in two weeks, personally. So we have an issue. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to address, John. I know. It is an issue of the highest importance, though. So I, I would suggest, and Dr. Krebs mentioned just a minute ago, possibly we even table this for the moment until Ms. Reed is here. And, and for the for the whole project and bring it let's let's do this and i'm i'm on this 
I believe discussion amongst everybody. We talked about things. I think that that would be the best solution here to get the. So what I would suggest is we amend the motion to only approve 3116 and, and 3304. Those were the other two. Right. And then remove 30, 3105 for discussion at the next meeting in conjunction with 2203. That makes sense? You know what? It's, it's a motion that's on the table. I just assume vote on it. Right? Does it, all right. Well, Does any, so then if we're going to vote on it, I'd like to raise the question because it seems to me that one of the reasons this was brought up initially was because we realized that board members did not have to pass any background checks. Board members were entering buildings and not passing any background checks. In terms of safety, we thought that that would make sense that all board members should have security, should be able to pass background checks. So to me, this is really an issue of safety. And I think that what I would want to do is if we're going to be talking about, you know, giving people unfettered access to the buildings. I would want to take it and see what the security professionals have to say about that, how they would want us to handle it. So again, if something happens in this district, the teacher's not responsible for it. A principal's not responsible for it. A superintendent's not responsible. It's the board members that are held responsible. Now you want the security professionals to clear us. It, it, we're an elected official here. If there's something wrong, I'm sure it'll be brought up publicly. Believe me, I, I'm, there's plenty of people that like to bring things up publicly. So I'm sure it'd be brought up publicly. I don't care if I get a background check. I thought I've had a background check. Maybe I have it. Maybe I have. I don't know. I couldn't tell you, but I've got a badge. If somebody wants to check my background, go ahead. I'm good with it. But why would you allow someone else to make the decision for us when we're ultimately the seven up here that are responsible for if anything happens in this district. I don't want to leave my fate in someone else's hands telling me whether I can go in a building or not. Well, I don't, At I don't, the end of the day, we're responsible. The seven of us I, up here are. I don't read it. There's nothing in here that I read that would give anyone authority to deny us. I mean, we're she an elected official. have the professionals. Ask them. What for, in terms opinion. of the checks, in terms of the, the actual checks. Yeah. Does right. anyone up here care if they get a background check? I don't care. If you get yeah. a bit. We, that this is new that we've done that. We hadn't had it in the past. Fine. Okay. I don't, I don't care. Go check my background. We, and we did. I agree with that. And that's what C is actually talking about, is about getting background. It's, it's about background checks. If you look on page 23. So if you go A is visitors, B is volunteers, C is frequent visitors. It's talking about the board members having um, background checks, the I check. So, so, so again, why do we need to check in with the principal if we're coming into the building? That's the other one. But that's, that's not that what this says, Bill. I mean, this doesn't say that. This is about this is about so background 3, checks. 3100 doesn't say a person visiting that? the school during instruction must first report to the building. This is vi this is visitors and volunteers. Okay, and, and again, so that we're not considered a visitor or volunteer. Right, right. As of right now, we're well, not. That's okay. my point. But you so, if, if, that's if, right, the next point, the, the one that's up for future next time. Yeah, that's right. And that's where there would have to be. I mean, obviously, we, there's been no discussion about that. So that's where we'd have to have a reconciliation of how that would apply. I agree. Again, who, who put who, who made that suggestion? They had board members to that. The 23. The board of ethics. The what? The board of ethics. The 2302. The, 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 who, who the uh, board of ethics? 2302 is all about the board. It's yeah. right. your right. rules. Right. Right. So who, who, who put that in there? Who, who decided to establish that? Who wrote that? So Alicia Reed wrote that? She brought ideas. She brought I, the whole policy was not written. You're right. Troon wrote their initial, but the addition of 18 or 19, those two pieces that are the additions that are proposed, those were brought to the policy committee uh, for review. And so, so Troon wrote those out. They wrote one through whatever, and the two new ones were written by, the, by a board member. And there's a motion on the table. All right. So does everyone want to move forward? Well, there's no, there's that. I just was saying, given the concerns that were raised, if, if it would be prudent to make an, a motion to amend to remove 3105 from approval tonight, have it be considered in conjunction with the other one in in two weeks and only vote on 30, 
one sixteen and thirty three oh four, which seem to be there, nobody seems to have an issue with those two. So there would have to be a motion to amend, though. Can I make a motion to table it? I think it's important. Well, you want the table thirty one oh five. Here's the thing. I I think that we should fix this right. I don't have a problem with getting a background check, and nobody up here that I know of does either. And I had them, I had all my, when I was coaching here, some things we had, I had all my volunteers get them. We got them, I got them. Thank you. Uh, back when we were coaching, you know, in Science Olympiad back when, and uh, all our coaches got them, all the people involved, we required them just automatically. If you're going to be in the school with students, you should have one. That's not a big deal. So that's not a, not a contentious issue at all. Zero about anything. I don't think anybody here has that issue, but... I'm going to suggest that because of the intermingling of this and how it has a bigger effect and a different effect than we all thought it was going to have, we put a stop to it right now and hold this. And I just make a motion to table the whole thing. It won't matter for another week or two, another few days. Okay, our, our position here is sign us up and Dr. Outlaw can get the iChat forms and bring them right up. We'll all sign one tonight. And uh, I believe everybody would agree to that, right? Anybody got a problem? Okay, takes care. Okay. But, but to clarify, John, you say table the whole thing. So it's combined, Roger. So we're going to separate it. I haven't honestly researched anything else with that type of overlap yet. All right, right. I'm not talking I about that. I've, I've read I've, it, I'm 30, not talking about that. I, I, no. What I'm saying is, so 3116 is the district. So there's three policies that are up for approval. 3105 is the one we've been all talking we about. We got to go back with them. So 3116 is the district technology and acceptable use, yeah. which talks about it has language where test administrators can wear electronic devices, but it it it, it, it restricts and clarifies what can be taken into. Fine. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So procedurally, we could still go forward with that approval. If you believe that's the best thing to do as the president of the board, then I would support that. And, and 3304 is the use of the district facilities, which adds the language that's highlighted on page 30 about um, the school facilities use and the approval process, completely unrelated to 3105. So is your motion to table an amendment to the approval so that, that only 3105 is tabled and the other two can be approved? Is that your motion? Get support for that. I'm good. With that. All right. I would support tabling 3105 and voting on 3116 and 3304. Okay. So we have a motion by Mr. Connolly, supported by Dr. Krebs. Any further discussion on only approving 3116 and 3304? Okay. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Any nays? That passes 6 0. Takes us to the grounds uh, maintenance agreement. What's it? You, you amended you amended the motion now you have a vote what's that well we approved okay all right so we have a, we have approved the amended amendment i i think it boots and belts and suspenders is fine so <laughs> so we now have a motion to approve uh as amended, policies 3116 and 3304 uh, that was on the table originally as modified. Um, all those in favor signify by, signify by aye. 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 Any nays? That passes 6-0. All right. Now we're on grounds maintenance agreement. This was discussed at the April 10th meeting. We had a lot of discussion about uh, bidders and how that would be done in the future, but the board was good with moving this forward for action, so we have brought it here for approval tonight. So do we have a motion to approve the uh, grounds maintenance agreement as presented? So, so moved, we have to moved by Dr. Krebs. I, I caught myself, uh, yeah. Dr. Krebs. <laughs> moved by Dr. Krebs. All right, I'll support it. Supported by Mr. Myers. Any discussion? Prior board meetings, I've um, asked Mike and, and this is something I know is absolutely on the record to um, revisit our district's payment terms associated with large procurements, whether it be services or goods that we buy. And um, to the best of my knowledge, Mike, I don't know that you've shared with the board the payment term policy that you've initiated, established for the district. Has that happened? A policy for it? You you manage and control and lead the finance part of our of our district. So, what what are the payment terms that you've proposed to us for consideration? 
I haven't brought any for consideration tonight. So what I'm doing is bringing forth the maintenance agreement to enter into a contract. We'll work on payment terms as we solidify that contract. Okay, well, I'll, I'll save the, the back and forth and we can talk about it offline. So when the contract will be accepted to be paid at the end of the time when he's done? No, it's usually done in a draw format. I'm asking the question. Um, okay, the next thing, how many bids do we get in regards to this? Two. Two bids. How big is this contract? It's for 200 and some thousand dollars. For how many years? It's for a three-year contract. So what's that? 800,000, 700,000? Rough terms, that's correct. And we had two bidders. That's correct. What do we do to solicit bids? We put it in the paper as a public notice. Anybody get on the phone and call anybody and see if they were interested and let them know what we had coming out for bids and try to line them up? We talked about it at the last meeting. The answer to that is no. Correct. Now, what? did you recently just do that with the snow plowing contract? We did do that with the snow plowing contract. how many people contract. showed up? For we had eight at the bid meeting. So there you have Right. Yeah, I did too. I did too. So, so then what I suggested possibly would work, but again, it's somebody in the board suggesting this and not the finance department or who's ever putting the RFP out that did this. Why, why is that, Mike? I mean, just out of curiosity, I mean, for everyone that exists in the public, again, this is not a political issue, I don't believe. It's our tax dollars. We all pay tax dollars into the, into the school district. Like running, we're still in 2023 running an ad like in the in the newspaper. I mean, newspapers are dying, and and I love reading newspapers. So this is not a knock on newspaper. I love reading the newspaper. Was a paper boy when I was a little kid, but like putting an ad in the newspaper for this type of a of a solicitation is to me like we're operating in the Stone Age. Fair enough. So what are we doing to change that? We're gonna to have to look to update how we do that, and that's just carry over from how we are hand, how we're statutorily required to handle like the construction aspect of things. We do still post in the paper because it's a requirement, not required to go out for bid for services, but we we did in this instance to try to get the best that we could get. So we're legally obligated to run an ad in the newspaper under construction under twelve sixty seven of the wow. of the school code. That's correct. We have to do that, and you have to put it on a website a state sponsored website for two weeks prior to the bid opening. That's correct. So going forward, I mean, have you thought about how we can apply what Bill's been proposing at prior board meetings and tonight? I mean, just so, so again, we're not, we'd love to get out of the, you know, we'd love for the administration to come to us with all of your great ideas to help us represent the taxpayers that we serve. Yeah. What ideas do you have to do that? Is it something you're going to do, the administration is going to do? Yeah, we will work on a new process for how we put out services. Uh, you know, obviously with the construction aspect of things, we're, our hands are tied. We have to meet the minimum requirements selected by the state. But under something like this, yeah, we have to, you know, in order to satisfy what the board members are looking for, we'll take another look at how we do business. But I mean, you as a steward, right? It, it don't, it, like I would, you say the satisfy the needs of the board members, like you are the, the steward, the champion of all of our tax dollars here for Brighton Area Schools. We want you to share the same level of initiative that we collectively share with our personal finances at home. So just, if I could just jump in, obviously this is a conversation we had at the last meeting. On this, one of the challenges that we talked about was the difference between grass cutting and then also the field maintenance. We had a dialogue around how in the future, maybe we break those into pieces. And so that was one piece of it. Uh, the second one, uh, the suggestion was taken and it was used for the uh, snow removal. And so, that, so, so that's how it's implemented. So the suggestion it went out, they called a bunch of different people and uh, I don't know how many additional came because of that, but um, that would be the evidence of modification of so the what would be great is for us to hear as a board we hear you bill great idea bill and i'm making a commitment to you going forward every solicitation that fits this bill here i will commit to you that we will get multiple quotes we'll call multiple vendors suppliers like that's all we want to hear 
we will take action on behalf of the community. That's all. Yeah, I mean, would you agree, Bill? Absolutely. That's what you're seeking? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. I am too. All right. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Any nays? Nay. Uh, one nay, so that passes 5-1. All right, that moves us to item G, the copier bid. Um, Nick? It's the countywide bid uh, to award Marco uh, copier service and then replace all the copiers in the district with Sharp Brand copiers. All right, do we have a motion to approve the copier bid? Moved by Mr. Trombley, supported by uh, Dr. Krebs. Any discussion? Mr. Conley. Yeah, we brought up and discussed the leasing options and all that. And I see that we kind of piggyback what other districts are doing. Um, did we look into the leasing option? So we did look into the leasing option. Uh, it's $5,900 a month uh, to lease for 60 months, um, and then another 2,000 for service. Um, that would bring us to a total of uh, $354,000, which is $102,000 more uh, with interest of what it would cost us just to purchase them outright. So we could probably purchase another half of a fleet for the amount of extra money that we would be paying to lease. The other important piece of this too um, is that the proposal to purchase is part of the technology piece of the bond. So the money to purchase the copiers will come out of the bond. If, as I understand it, correct yes. me if I'm wrong, Nick, That's if right. we go with a lease, we, we that all has to come out of general fund. We can't, that cannot be part of the, what was the original. Yeah. Okay. So. We wouldn't want to drastically overpay not to have it come out of the I got it. When we purchase, in, instead of leasing, do we buy the service contract that you referenced? When I, if I heard you correctly, you mentioned that there's a lease rate and then there's a service that we pay for the to have the machine extra serviced. It's extra. Well. How much extra is the service? The, extra, uh, the service is $2,070 a month. So over the term of the contract, over what's the? Over the term of the contract, is 2000 yes, per month. So not reflected in this bid. I guess what's the aggregate roughly? So twenty four thousand dollars per year for, for for five years. So one hundred twenty five. So one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars of the total that you referenced for the lease machines represents a service contract for no. someone. No. That would be on top. Yeah, that's what I meant. That if I said oh. said something different, I meant it's on top of the actual lease would, rate yes, of the machine. Would be on top of the actual lease agreement. The lease agreement alone is the three hundred fifty four thousand dollars for five years. And then, what is the actual cost to purchase? It is uh, without so, the service. Uh, it's one hundred. Uh, yeah, it was, it's one hundred ninety four thousand three hundred dollars. Wow, big difference. Yeah. And so, is the district's intent to purchase? I would like to purchase, yes. Service. In addition to the actual machines? Correct, yes. On top of the actual machine purchase, correct. And the service rate's the same? Yes. Whether or not we, whether or not we lease or purchase, the service rate would be the same. Yes. Did we, did we get, go ahead, Bill. bids did you get? Uh, 15. Wow. Here we go. Kudos to you. That's awesome. Thank you. Was there a big range? Uh, there wasn't a huge range. I mean, yes, there was, of course, there were some huge outliers, but everybody was kind of in there, you know, kind of in, in a similar range to each other. Well, our idea of what the extremes were, just out of curiosity. Uh, I mean, I think we had some, even the, you know, the per click charges where you'd have normal color would be 0 0.03. We had some of them at 0 0.07. Wow. We would have like, well, you know, like a black and white would be 0 0.003. We'd have like a 0 0.10. So, I mean, there's, you know, three times as much for service charges what you'd have. And then you'd have copiers that were, you know, double in price. Wow. Yeah. So our lifespan of this, did you get, are you getting yeah. Okay. So the lifespan of this purchase is how many years? So this purchase, uh, I mean, if we were going to purchase them, I would probably plan to do five to seven years, which is what we've normally done with copiers. Seven years is what these ones are at about now, which gets us somewhere around, you know, four to five million copies on the copier. Is there any type of a guarantee on the machines where we say we get a two-year initial guarantee and we don't need to buy service for the first two years? Like, how, any considerations there? So there's no consider. No, they because most of the service they do, like I said, a per click charge or whatever you print uh, on the machine individually. So then they they do it like a they do an average of like a percentage of what you know, like a point zero zero three 
of black and white are, are for, and that's what they include all in the service as well. So if we did not have a service contract and the machine breaks three months in, then we, they, would, be, we would be responsible for whatever oh, service. Wow. Yes. Wow. What a racket. Yes. Yeah. 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 In, in the current program we have now, do we have the same company that we're hiring to service them? Or no, no, it's different. different. Conoco was the one before, yeah. and Mar we're moving to Marco. Okay. And the service program currently and what we're running, is that all worked out like everybody thought it would? Yes, it's relative, it's relatively the same price as what we were paying. All our so. teachers are happy with that. They're here. I can ask them. Okay. <laughs> that's why we're switching. Yeah. That's why we're switching from Conica to Mark. <laughs> so. That's what I was thinking. There could have been a few improvements on the system. Yeah. And so our contract with them for this 125000 I understand, is for how many years? Um, it would be four or five years okay. for the service period. And then after that, we're paying for them outside of that contract. If we can, we can sign up for additional time if we want, or we can go back out for bit again. Okay. Any further? No? All right. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Any nays? That passes 6 0. All right. That moves us to the Scranton Art, Art Room updates. Um, Strangler. Oh, I was going to pass it to Bill on this one, actually. Uh, these are the Scranton Art Room upgrades that were, uh, I believe they're at the request of the bond committee. All right, I'll go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. No, I, I was just, uh, I was trying to find my paper, unless you have, what's the amount on it? 60. It, it totals 66,606. 60. Yeah, so this is, this is through Clark Construction. This is additional work that after going through the, the punch list at Scrant and things that we feel needed to be done in order to complete the project as a whole. And again, some of them are, some of the rooms didn't have the upgraded flooring in it. We're gonna do it, we might as well do it right and finish the floors. Um, we putting a dust collector back in Scranton that for the wood shop and the new equipment that was just purchased to go in there. We need that kind of things. Um, the emergency shut off for the power, those kinds of things. So. Again, this is uh, additional monies that are coming out of the contingency fund in order to finish Scranton's uh, art room area. And I, I think it's what four rooms, five rooms, something like that. I, I don't remember. It's a, it's a pretty good size of Scranton though. And again, uh, it's 66,606.51 uh, out of contingency dollars for this. And again, the reason why we're bringing it to you is because this work's going to be done this summer if it gets approved with contractors that we already have on board, which would eliminate potential of not getting bids or getting higher bids because the contractors are already um, booked and being able to fit within our schedule this summer for school to open in the fall. All right. Thank you, Mr. Travel. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the uh, Scranton arm, Art Room upgrades? Motion. Support. Motion by Mr. Connolly, supported by Mr. Trombley. Any further discussion? Mr. Connolly. I'm glad to hear we're taking care of the details. Very important. Not to just throw, throw it out there and see what happened. We're following up. And uh, so whoever's behind that, it's Michael and Bill and the team, um, makes me uh, feel confident that we're doing our jobs here. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Many nays. That passes 6 0. That takes us to item I, the change order number 457. Yep. And again, this is this is an additional um, change order. It, when Scranton, we redid the HVAC system there last year. The way the system was designed, it was to replace the existing units and put units back in that matched. Through the bidding process and through the contractors, the units that were put in met the specs and they were approved, but no one from the architectural side of it went back to review the shop drawings to make sure the system would work. So once these units got installed and all hooked up, it didn't operate the way it was supposed to operate for heating and cooling. 
So in further investigation and looking at it, there needs to be some additional valves added and some uh, in the loop system in order to make the system function properly. Now we've in the bond committee, we've gone back to the engineering, we've gone back to the architect, we've gone back to Clark Construction. We've asked every question we need to ask in regards to this. And again, the system worked fine when the other things were there. It was replacing it. Again, it was a different manufacturer. Now the system doesn't work. We need to have this approved in order for them to switch these valves, these actuators, cost of that is 46573 and again we're asking you to come back and to approve that money so the system will work properly the way it's supposed to work all right thank you we have a motion to approve change order number 457 so moved Moved by mr traveling right. support of mr Connolly. any discussion yeah i do a little discussion and so this isn't the first time this has happened with this group including yep. the safety um ramps at the high school in the uh, catwalks and everything else when they had the opportunity to, I I'm gonna say follow what was gonna be right in a way that not saying what they did was wrong, but it didn't take everything into consideration. How does that sound? There were things that weren't considered when we bought these and these have been a problem since the day they put them in. This is not a new problem. They had to manually switch those for a while and it is not good for those machines. They were not on a, they, they kind of work on a rheostat basis, kind of like your, your light dimmer switch in your home and they ramp up and they ramp down. They were, they were hard switching these for a while, if I recall. Is that correct, Bill? Uh, not on these new units because these were just replaced last year, but they never functioned properly and that's what they were doing in order. They hard switched them. Yeah. yeah, they hard switched them. So, so back to the design and everything, it was wrong. And, and again, back to maintenance and long term, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this equipment. So this was missed in the process of the engineering and and will we get the lifespan out of them we're supposed to get? Well, 10 and 20 and 30 years from now, we're gonna know. And we may not know in the first five years because the, the damage could be done, not show up till later in the longevity of these units. So I'm just gonna bring that to the board's attention. There were some things missed. And, and just like at the high school, we put the other units up that they couldn't service them. There's no way to fix the things after they put them up. So we need to stay, keep an eye on those things. Keep a, keep a sharp pencil on it and I, and, and, but we are paying the bill each time this goes wrong, even though we paid a proper amount of money under bid that we paid, you know, we, we agreed to the amount and here, do it right. Nobody here said cut corners, nobody. He said, do it hundred percent right. So we're just catching up a little bit on something that, that a supplier missed and we're gonna pay for their mistake. Correct, Bill? Yep, okay. yep, and right. if we don't, then the system sits there and it doesn't operate and the way, the way it should. So we'll, we'll agree that we'll take money out of the contingency, which then could have been used for science labs, could have been used for microscopes. Okay, and we're gonna pay for this. Mm -hmm. so, all right. All right, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Any nays? That passes 6-0. That closes for action, moves us into for future action. Item A is the 2023-2024 LESA budget. Uh, Dr. Alwa. Yep, uh, this is uh, an annual um, annual endeavor. LESA uh, had a session for board members where they walked through their budget on uh, the day of the um, county, county school board meeting. Um, also, they provided a video which I shared with board members and uh, the documents. Um, and this is for future action. If you do have specific questions about the LESA budget, um, the contacts are in there, so you would reach out to uh, Mike Hubert from LESA if you have any questions about their budget. We did not create it, so we're not in a position to answer their questions, but uh, Mike Hubert would be happy to answer any question that you have. I have one question, Dr. Alla. Do you, what is the, do you know what the number, well, let's say an investment that LESA has in our school system, how many staff do they send to us as far as that they pay for, that we don't have to pay for? You know I, I don't know the exact number, uh, Mr. Scaling or anybody, do you know the exact number? It's exactly it's know. it's social workers, psychologists, um, and our technology folks, and then uh, our special education director. And then obviously our transportation department 
is is a county consortium. Reading through their budget, will it show how much effect they have on Brighton Area Schools? Does it show specifically what they contribute to us, or is that something we could just ask and you could bring it I back think, to us? I think that's something. If the contact number, if you have a question for Mike Hubert, just contact him directly on it. Okay. Well, I'd okay. like to have Chad, Dr. No, Mr. Scalin, bring it back if you could. If you could bring that back, how how that impact impacts our school? What is what does LASA as a countywide entity? services all of the school districts what what does it do for us basically is what i want to know and what areas does it affect us and and in a way um you know i'd like to affect us more and better let's see what we can do to you know if there's more programs or more things they that we could add to what they can do or if they're not uh, or if they're doing so well that we don't need to look at more things um, but i know that they they sit on a lot of uh, livingston county taxpayers money and and howell and uh I want to make sure it's getting out to our kids. Qu question I have is from an administrative point of view, the, the administration's point of view, um, are there programs or offerings from Lisa that we should be aware of as a board that maybe we're not? I mean, as you interface with the organization, are there ways that you've thought about being able to leverage these resources for the betterment of our community and the betterment of the school district? Are there things we can do with them to perhaps engage and help further and further our district, advance our district? So the, what's in the budget is a carryover from the previous year. So there's no new staff. There's nothing that's different. This is what they have done in the past. But answering your question, um, the, uh, the services that they do provide for us I think they have found, uh, you know, the economies of scale with those skilled labor people in, in uh, social work, psychology, and some of those areas that are harder to fill. They're able to collaborate across the county with that. So I think that's, I wasn't here when that, when that started, but that's, we've been served pretty well um, by working together with the county when it comes to special education and some of those support services. And then the second big area that I would say um, is going really well is that sometime in the past, the board members would know when uh, the school districts moved away from having their own uh, transportation departments, but collectively worked together, which I believe lowered cost and um, at, at the time. And I, so I would say that that's a big benefit to us by working through LESA. Are there other areas? Yes. Um, we had a meeting just a couple weeks ago. We had some representatives there. We are working on some areas around center programs which deal with some of the behavior challenges with some of the students. Uh, there's some good collaboration around the county that LESA is going to take a lead on. Um, so yes, there are definitely areas. Um, LESA is uh, very open to ideas and we, we're part of collaborating with them on a number of topics. But special education, uh, some of those support services are some of the big areas that they serve us with. And you and I have had some conversation about that and avenues of opportunity that exist there based on your prior experience. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. That moves us to item B, the resolution to designate districts LESA election representative. Dr. Allah? Sure. Yep. There are, uh, there are two open seats here and uh, both people that are running, uh, Don Cortez from Howell, and then Luann Loy from Brighton, uh, they are up for re-election and the board at the next meeting will need to uh, vote on that and, make, and uh, submit your vote, support. And, and just for clarification, uh, we are only voting on the Brighton representative, the Luann Loy, I believe, is that correct? Because Don Cortez is the, is the Howell designee. So the, the proposed, in uh, this question I had, so the district's representative in the proposed um, resolution has an initial identification, which would be Luann Loy, and then an alternate. I don't know, is there anybody else that's even thrown their hat in the ring as an alternate? Not for Brighton. Okay. Nope. But, but I thought board members, I thought you were to select um, two members from the board, and I thought it was you and Ken Stahl last year or the year before, a couple years ago, um, He's back there. Oh, that he was the alternate, and then also the, and somebody went in uh, to that meeting. I There's the information. Oh, so this. Your vote, so so you're going to be 
So this is the the designation of the board members as the LSA. Okay, not okay, right, All right. So we need two district board. We need two board members to throw their hat in the ring as the primary and the alternate. Mr. Well, put your hand up, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, think we got two weeks to make that decision. All right. Usually, whoever doesn't show up, you know. Right. All right. Um, that moves us uh, to item C, the property tax uh, resolution L4029. Uh, it's that time of year again where the board will need to approve the tax rates for the coming uh, fiscal year. Um, the L4029 will come to the next meeting for action. The unfortunate, and it'll come for action at the next meeting because the the taxing entities, the townships and the city need that information by June 1st in order to create tax bills for July 1. Unfortunately, today was the day that the county uh, equalization released uh, the, the data. So um, I got the data this afternoon I uh, did take a look at it, and unfortunately, I did kick it back to equalization for some, uh, clearly there was a formula error in their worksheet. So uh, we, what I did have time to look at and what I can tell you is that normally, you know, what we have is we have operations, you know, 18 mills that's levied against all uh, non-homestead properties, and then we have um, we have our unlimited decks, a debt, uh, millage as well. So as far as the uh, operations, I'm always first looking to see, especially in this environment, whether or not we're going to have a headly rollback and whether that's going to affect us or not. We are hedged out above the 18 mils uh, that we've talked about before. We're in the 21 mil range. So even if we had a headly rollback, it wasn't going to affect our 18 mil levy at this time. But um, the state set the inflation factor because if property taxes rise faster than inflation, there is a headly rollback that's triggered. Um, the state set the inflation uh, factor at 7.9%. So it appears based on what I did see that we are not going to have a headly rollback this year. So that will come through at 18 mils and then the debt millage is whatever it takes to cover next year's costs. And that's typically been running at 7.19 mils, but as we've talked about in the past, that is set to start dropping off in the next uh, two years. So there's more discussion on that as, as we get there. But just so you're aware, we will bring it forward for action at the next meeting. And I will have the L4029 prepared at that time. So what was your concern with what you originally looked at that they sent you? When I, <laughs> well, when I opened it and looked at it, I compared it to last year because there's always, you know, that's the starting point, and it just looked off. Something, something clearly wasn't being picked up because it was about 200 million shy of what I anticipated that taxable value number to be. So I looked at it, and then I looked at the backup that was with it, and it didn't reconcile. So that's when I called the county and said, hey, we got an issue. And, and she acknowledged that there was a formula error somewhere in all of that, and she was fixing it, and I'll have it you're tomorrow. You're fixing their books. Well, and, and not fixing it, but you're correcting yeah. their books. I, I just wanted to make sure that we were on the same page, that we didn't have some giant loss in, in taxable value, which I knew we didn't. But. Thank you. All right. Uh, that moves us to item D, the Troon Policy 2302. We've talked briefly about this. I, I, my suggestion is we leave it on for future action next week. And quite frankly, I, I would suggest that even the 3105 go back to for future action next week and be discussed and neither of them be up for action um, at the next meeting. So I think everyone's good with that. All right. And that closes out uh, the for future action portion of our agenda. Uh, moves us into board reports. I'd like to add something. I think, um, I think, I think that we have Hawkins teachers here. I just want to say that um, on May 4th, uh, Thursday, I came home and there was this little plant in front of on, on my porch, which is the sweetest thing. It was from Hawkins. I think it was the kindergarten teachers. Would you, 
Um, are you Miss Sense? Yes. Would you like to say, would you say, but it was just the sweetest thing. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, in our curriculum, it was a it was a culmination of many, many, many different pieces of curriculum. Kindergarten was a lot of heavy work in curriculum, and so we uh, we study our place in our location on Earth, and, and um, as part of our mapping unit and as part of our Earth science and social studies units, we also talk um, about um, in our science units we watch um, the changing seasons and notice what happens in all the various parts of of our our school grounds. What happens? In all the different seasons, we notice the changes in the animals and the plants and living and non-living things we look at. So anyway, all these little topics, including our effort all year long to talk about building our, our community, our, our classroom family, our school family, our Hawkins family, our neighborhood family, and being kind to another, one another, sharing our love, our smiles, our happiness, our joys. We sing songs about that, how if you smile, it's contagious, and then people around you smile and if you um, share your love, people will come back at you. And there's all these songs that we sing in our culminating event. And, and, um, and what we also do every month is some sort of community service where we give back. So our give back community service in May for May, May 1st, spring, you know, May, uh, April showers bring May flowers. And May 1st is traditionally the day culturally where you share flowers with families and neighbors. Bringing our community, our map, we have been mapping our school, mapping our neighborhoods. We went out into our neighborhoods. And brought we planted flowers because that's what we've been noticing in our outer, outdoor classroom growing. So we planted some flowers in little cups, and we added a little note that would hopefully bring joy and smiles to our, our neighborhood community and bring love and let them know that we're thinking about them and bring all of that culmination into our neighborhood community. So just however far our feet could walk, <laughs> the houses that were the closest to the 120 kindergarten children who we we just went out and dropped um, at our porches in groups of, you know, with a parent helper, in groups of six, we just walked to neighborhood porches and just left a little surprise with a little note saying that your, your Hawkins kindergarten families are, are your Hawkins, Hawkins kindergarten friends are bringing you, hoping to bring spring flowers and joy and happiness to you. And we just left, we didn't ring doorbells or anything like that, we just left it right there, a little surprise and kept on walking. And then of course, while we were out there, we were just kind of talking and wonder, you know, what they're gonna say and what their faces are gonna be. And sometimes we did see neighbors and say, oh, did you notice they're smiling? And then the weeds smile, like, oh, it's contagious, and get really excited about that and sing songs along the way. So it was a very, very special moment the entire time that we were out doing it. And then hiking back in the rest of the day, the smiles on their faces and just like, oh, maybe we'll, maybe we'll spread some more joy. Maybe we'll spread some more joy. And that's what it was. And, and I heard sure did that you too. were one of our porches. <laughs> yes. And it was actually my class, I think, that was in your porch. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I, I just wanted everybody to acknowledge <laughs> that, that, that that was, <laughs> I hadn't seen that before. And it was really, it was really sweet. And it really did make me smile. And I saw a couple other neighbors and we kind of were all smiling, just really happy. It does just. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, we were able to expand it to all four kindergarten classrooms this year. Okay. And we hadn't done it since before the pandemic. It was only localized to like one. Our classes before now we've been able to get all four kindergarten classrooms on board so we were hit many more houses so we hit 120 houses great thank you yeah so that that was something i want to share the second thing i want to share was actually on that that evening um i went to an lesa legislative chat that evening which where um a couple of our state representatives and a representative from our u.s representative were there and talking about um the kindergarten early childhood coming forward. And it was just kind of a discussion about things that are happening. So just kind of a notice to let people know, um, LESA is really talking about that. If you have, if anybody has questions on that, they should be contacting LESA. There's lots of opportunities for them to talk to people about the early childhood, the universal preschool things that are coming down um, and what it's gonna look like. So I would just encourage people to reach out to LESA if they have some questions. Great. Mr. Conley? Yeah. Um, report on the, from the Finance Committee. Uh, we reviewed uh, custodial financials, the, what it would take to have full-time our own employees versus the other, which we'd already talked about here as well. Um, but they're working on some hybrid options to see what they can bring back to us for permanent. Um, we talked about what we pay our staff a little bit. We talked that we're uh, top in the county for our teaching staff. And then in the state of Michigan, we're in the top was it 30%, correct? Okay, top 30% in the state of Michigan. Um, so we should be able to afford to pay our maintenance and custodial staff enough here. That's the point. So um, 
and then also we talked about substitute teachers and what our costs were on substitute teachers. We also discussed how the contract was negotiated where our teachers would be bonused. I believe it's $75 a day for unused days they could take off. Is that correct? I believe that number's correct. Okay, all right. Well, versus us paying for substitutes at a higher rate. But my contention is if we got to pay the substitutes more, maybe we just pay the teachers more and we don't have to pay the subs. But anyhow, the substitute that we're paying, if I get the numbers correct, it, it's uh, it'll hit uh, near $2 million for the year. Is that correct, Dr. Outlaw, that's what we're forecasting? Substitutes? No, I think it was uh, more in the area of about a little over a million, about 1.1 million. A million now, though. It was now in... We were not. We were going to return to the pre-pandemic kind of number, which was about 1.1 1 .1 to 1 1.2. During the pandemic, we were about 1.6 million. I think the last two years, if I'm, I, I don't have the sheet in front of me. That's fine. But, it's close enough. Yeah, so, but so we're returning to pre-pandemic era, is which news, is around 1.1 million. Which is good. Yep. We're heading the right direction, but we still spend in excess of a million dollars in substitute teachers. So again, that's a million dollar expenditure out of the general fund. And, and sometimes that's, uh, you know, it's required as part about having, you know, hundreds of employees, uh, but it's a lot. Um, and we talked about the funding source for the storage building, which we'd already cleared up. That's going to be contingency spending the storage building at the bus garage at the maintenance facility, which is fine. I think it's a great thing for it to do um, for my position. Uh, we talked about uh, the dis how the financial reporting was from the district and how we report it, the state requires a certain level of reporting and board members questions were, well, I'd like to have instant access to that. Well, Mike can help us with that and send an email. It's, it's automatic. You can go online and look at what we're doing in a, in, a, in a dated sense. Mike, what's the current, how current are we online as far as our finances? It's current as of today. Today. I believe so. I mean, we update in the board packet uh, checks all the time and then we add stuff to the website the transparency website all the time so what i'd like to do though is if you could send an email to all the board members on how they access that and what the routine is i know it's on our website but and here's the kind of procedural thing that way it's clear and if we want anything different than that then we just have to go it's mr Ingliter in his office because i know for certain you can give him a call and he'll sit down and talk to you about finances and anything we don't know. You can go right in the office and sit down and ask questions. And if you get them as questions ahead of time, you probably have better answers, right? Right. Um, uh, uh, JROTC concept. Um, got a little more steam behind it um, and where the county came in and asked for an application for ARPA funding, and Dr. Mosier, uh, I believe, handled that on behalf of the county's request. Is that correct? Okay, so that got back to the county, and with that is is part of um, a funding source where they had one-time money come in, and I believe the number is thirty-seven million, where they may be able to allocate part of those funds to help us do a startup, and it'd be initial discussion as a four-year kind of concept. Um, but we don't know where that's going yet, but uh, Dr. Mosier has given them all the information they need at the county to see, and then we'll bring back more information if that is approved at the county level, which I think is a great relationship. It's not a partnership. It's just, uh, they call it county ERPA funding uh, attached application, and it's a funding that's available for the correct opportunities within this, our area. It's a lot of money that was handed to Houston County. So it'd be nice to see part of it get to Brighton schools. Um, so that's going well. And then we also discussed the vending machines and that there are bids on the table for Pepsi and Coke and are being developed. Um, and they discussed the how the financing was handled with the current vending machine programs. And we had some board member questions about that. And I wanna say that also on the finance committee, anybody that has anything they wanna question on or haven't put anything, it'll get on the agenda, anything. So just ask the question. So I'm gonna put it back on the Mike's shoulders to explain exactly how each division is handling the vending machines. I'll dump it on you because I don't want to put words in your mouth. So uh, this was just a quick short. I mean, as far as I can tell, the department that has the vending machines collecting the cash and depositing that into the district funds, 
what more did you need? Okay, to and, then, and then who pays for the product that goes in the vending machines? The department. Their own department does. Yeah. But not us from the administration. Administration doesn't write a check for a truckload of Pepsi. I'm sure we probably, it funnels through us. I mean, they're not, they're not taking cash and buying Pepsi, but. Okay, well, but the question was though, specifically on these accounts, how they're being handled and monitored. And it's come up in other questions and other folks that have accounts that they handle within the school. And that's why this came up and we wanna make sure it's fair and balanced for everybody. So in this case, Bill, do you have a question? Sure, I was the one that asked the question. And my question is, obviously someone goes and takes the quarters or the dollars out of those machines. Someone has to go and restock those machines. Someone has to purchase the product to put in those machines. When I asked the question, I was told it was the secretaries that does this, at least. Okay. What's that? Okay. So the secretary goes and she counts how many bottles of pop she puts in the machine, and then she counts the cash to make sure however many bottles that were sold out of the machine reconciles with the cash. Okay. Is that correct? Full detailed report on uh, reconciliation on how it gets done. No, I'm asking the question. Like, why, why do you, why, why do you, I mean, your body language says that you're kind of discounting the concern. I mean, there's a genuine concern that I, board I'm members are expressing. Your, your concern is coming up under board reports. It's not an agenda topic. I'll answer it. I'll go get the answer for you, well, but I don't have the you internal haven't let me controls. Finish asking you the question, but if you want me to, go well, ahead and tell me what my answer is. It's, it's a fair question that they're asking when they have. It is a fair question. I think and it's I'm, helpful if, I mean, if, if he, I mean, if they, if he wants a report, have him come back at the next meeting and provide has, a report. He I hasn't mean, even let me ask, finish asking my question what I wanted. Oh, okay. So again, I, I'd like to know again, who takes the cash out of the machine an X amount of money comes out of the machine. I'm assuming somebody counts that money. And then I'm assuming there's X amount of bottles that got put in that machine. And does somebody say, okay, there's, you know, $200 here that accounts for uh, 150 bottles of pop, and that's the reconciliation. Or, gee, there's $200 here, and we only sold 50 bottles of pop. How do we know that what's going in and coming out of that machine, other than somebody's word, where's that cash going? And Good I, question. Sure. Okay, that's my question then. Just to, just to clarify, there's one vending machine in athletics, and then we have some vending machines in the the lunchroom. Yep. Um, so it's not a not a large scope. I'm just saying for that. So um, I had shared before that the athletic trainer works with athletic secretary yep. regarding the one machine. Yep. And all the money goes through our system. Yep. And then the uh, Food service, it's done by food service staff yep. through their system. So I got those um, texts, but again, that's not answering my question. Yeah. Well, what's your question? I, I again, guess I don't understand your question. Okay, either. well, let me I mean, let me tell you my question again, Roger. Okay. And again, I think you're you understand this. If you put a hundred bottles of pop in and the bottles are a dollar a piece, you go to the machine and you pull out a hundred and ten dollars. Does the 110 go in as what was taken out of the machine? Or because there was 100 bottles, only $100 goes in, and gee, this $10, who knows where the $10 goes? It's all cash. Who, who keeps track of what goes in the machines and who reconciles what comes out of the machines with what goes back into the machines? Well, Just, it probably, I mean, I don't know. It probably depends on whether it's athletics or what. Right, so, so I'm assuming the athletic secretary as Dr. Outlaw and the trainer they're probably the ones that do that, yeah. right? Okay. Are we just taking their word for it? That's good. Well, what do you want? That's what I'm saying. I don't understand your question either. Are you, you want them to, is there a form that you want to I don't know. Is reconciled? I, I'm not the finance guy. That's why I'm asking the question. I could tell you what I think should happen because right now, as we've appearing to see some of the other cash transactions that have happened in this district, who, who's accounting for the cash? other than the secretary and the trainer and the food service people. I don't know. Do, do, does twenty dollars come out of there that gets unaccounted for? Does so, so we'll we'll get you we'll get you the specific reports on how they do it. These are all professionals, these are all good people. 
And I don't think I, we I'm have any reason that. to be I'd just like to see the backup. People. That's what I, I love. They're, 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 they're taking money. They have vending machines so that they can put that back into the athletic right. training back to our kids. Yeah. And uh, so if we can find out what their specific reporting system is so that they keep track of it. I know that they shared that they have some sort of ledger, I know, from the athletic department. So we'll get that for you, and we'll get that to the board. With a total of how much each one of these machines generates as well, right? So we'll, per get, year? we'll get you the information about the process. And then, as you know, we're getting some bids um, from Pepsi and uh, from Coca-Cola about a larger contract for the district. And uh, it will probably be a different process, but we could talk about that at another time. So... So in conclusion, though, this comes down to running a business within the school, not overseen necessarily by the school, but needs to be overseen by the school because of some past things that have gone on about things not being overseen and people were held responsible. We're in a position that we're want to make sure everybody's on the same plate, the yeah. page, that everybody gets treated the yeah, same. I think, we, Should it, I think we're, we're going to get you the information on it, but fine. I think... I mean, we ha we have oversight, and we just we aren't able to just share the specific detail on what they do in each department. But we'll get that for you. Okay. Thank you. Next, so again, Mr. Tramley brought it up. I thought it was worthy of a finance committee meeting. Then next on the list is we're going to have a report back on the scrap metal situation. Is that prepared? Was we discussed it, and is it ready to come before the board? Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll get you an update. It will probably be out tomorrow. Okay. And that's for both programs for so the question was uh specific to maintenance and operations you asked that the other one yes. uh come back to the finance committee so i did yep okay. and then uh, we had a meeting today okay. uh, that information is being gathered okay good okay that'll be fine thank you and then um we discussed uh vape, vape detectors again about the importance of it we talked about the pilot is on underway so the pilots we've made the investments um, and then we'll have another report shortly to see what the success is. There's, there's, there's reports back that these are successful and there's reports back that they're not successful. Um, so, um, I guess maybe between us and the board, maybe let's, uh, I'd like to have officer Christy Bell come in and do the report and with her position on it as a law enforcement officer. And if that has to be a closed session, I guess, then it'd be decided. But I, I'd like to have just open board for discussion. I think you could do it in open. Yeah, I don't okay. think there's any reason you couldn't no. do that. And I would so then, I'd encourage you to have both Officer Bell and Deputy Schuster his aren't present. Running. His are not running yet. His aren't up and running yet. But but they will be. But when you get your report, I think it'd be good to get it from the different buildings, perhaps Officer Mitchell, too, from Malpe. That'd be great. Okay. We have a, and I think then the board knows what direction that we need to go. But I, I want full steam ahead, though, on our end, on finance, where... We have a package on the table and then we can then bring it to back to the board so as soon as possible so starting next year everything will be done when these kids come into school whatever is the right thing to do on this project is that fair okay all right thank you and i think that's uh, that's it on the finance committee meeting i had something that's brought to my attention um that some people felt uh, that my way I handled some projects here was could have been done a little better. Well, I want to share with you that um, I'm looking forward to working together and supporting our joint efforts uh, to move our district forward. And I'm serious about that. Um, and I'm going to do my best to do that. 100% um, my intent has only been to look out for the best interests of the students at Brighton Area Schools. And um, I can tell you that sometimes when you get a pile of stuff on your desk and you want to make it all work out, it becomes a little bit overwhelming. And, um, and I think that uh, in fairness to all my board members and our public and, and our staff and everything else, I'm uh, looking forward to working with everybody on this and to do a really good job. So thank you. That's all I have. Anybody else? Uh, the only thing I just want to add, um, we discussed at the executive committee session, uh, executive committee meeting, I should say, um, last week. Um, the consensus was that we felt it was very, it was, we had a really productive meeting at the workshop. Um, it gave us an opportunity to really do a deep dive into to various topics that were not constrained by the formalities of our business meeting. And, uh, the three of us, uh, 
Ms. Marks, Mr. Trombley, and I um, all agreed that it might be prudent for us um, moving forward to perhaps um, utilize the, for the meetings um, that we have um, currently scheduled uh, on our on our calendar for the second Monday of the month to, on a going forward basis, use that as a workshop so that you know, as topics come up, as topics, or if there's, you know, if there's things that we need to discuss further, I mean, obviously we're going to have a continuation of the digitization. Um, you know, a future workshop will give us the opportunity to get the feedback, to be able to, um, you know, further, you know, talk through those issues. And um, we just felt the three of us that that would be um, really a, a good collaborative, productive way to to talk about whatever issues um, from a planning standpoint, um, from a just a deeper dive um, analysis of, you know, four or five, whatever topics we have on the agenda. So if, you know, if, if the rest of you support that, we, we would like to move in that direction. Um, and uh, certainly, and then obviously there may be things that come up um, in that context where if we have something on the bond, you know, where we have a change order, we might need to add it, you know, on the workshop for, you know, for action, which is not a problem, but we just felt that that was going to be a, a really a good opportunity to, you know, have further, dialogue regarding, you know, various topics and help us further plan. So, Bill. And just to that, and again, I don't, I, I think we should keep the two hours and maintain that two hours, hard stop in two hours. Maybe each subject gets 20 minutes and maybe there's five subjects, whatever on the list. And whoever wants to get their subject on the list first, it goes on the list, call Roger, he'll put them on there. And then if it needs to roll to the next, I'm assuming this I may like yeah. may roll into monthly meetings possibly, and then it'll just roll to the next yeah. month, and you'll be the first one on the list then if that's the case. If so it doesn't disappear. But again, I think it's very important to keep that two hours and we're done and we're out of here. I agree. So. Okay. All right. That concludes everything on our agenda for this evening. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we appreciate your participation and attention. Our next meeting will be uh, Monday, May 22nd at 7 p.m. This meeting is adjourned. Matt? I've been amazed at how well you've some people that